All right, well, let's talk about your career. We're with uh, Johnny Hyde, a legendary Croy figure. Before Croy, tell us about your career uh, leading up to Croy. You know, my career actually started when I was a kid, and the only thing I wanted in my life was to be on the radio, period. So I would start by what they call DXing, which is where you take a, a radio and try to fine tune it to get each radio station that you can listen to. And it was pretty good at that time because there wasn't the uh, pollutants in the air which cuts down the signal of a particular radio station. Plus there weren't a lot of signals interfering with each other. Right? Correct. So you go and uh, I can remember going to bed every night using my body as a natural antenna. <laughs> and this is in the Midwest because I grew up in St. Louis. Okay. So I had the opportunity not only to listen to the St. Louis radio stations, but also those stations in Illinois, like Chicago, sure. going down to East St. Louis, which was WLW. And that was my first taste of rhythm and blues. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know... There's a lot of people who think that Elvis Presley had the first recording of uh, Heartbreak Hotel right, or this Hound, type Dog. Of, uh, Hound Dog, you know, <laughs> and they never heard of Mama Thornton. Right. Or they never even heard of Bill Haley and the Comets at that time. And this is going back years before Rock Around the Clock. Okay. His first hit was called Crazy Man Crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was on the old Essex label at the time. Bill Haley even had records in the late 40s, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's the period of time that I'm talking about. Okay. That was the first rock and roll record I think I ever heard was Bill Haley and the Comets, Crazy Man Crazy, okay. on KXLW in somewhere in the Missouri area. Small radio station used to play it all the time. So that was my inkling. I wanted to be in radio and... I would search the dial. I was just a total geek at it. And at that time, uh, at KXOK in St. Louis, you could actually go into uh, an audience setup, like theater seating in the studios, to watch the disc jockey wow. uh, as he played <laughs> the records. And he like would a concert. signal. <laughs> yeah. He would signal into the sound booth, and that's where the music came from. And he would have guests. I remember, in particular, I guess the one that stood out was Patty Page. And here I am. I would walk from high school uh, and take a couple of transit cars and then walk another two or three miles in order to get to the radio station, go up in the booth, and to sit there and to watch Ed Bonner on KXOK and his afternoon radio program, which included guests like Patty Page. And I'm sitting there totally awestruck at this woman. You know, this is, I'm in Nirvana at this point. Mm -hmm. and then television was just coming in. Mm -hmm. And the first TV station in St. Louis was KSD TV. And uh, they also had a viewing booth mm -hmm. to where you could, you know, because nobody could afford to buy television sets at the time. Right. And if you wanted to watch something like the Milton Berle Hour, or Bishop Fulton J. Sheen on the Dumont Network, the appliance store in town would put a, a TV set in the window and a speaker that hung outside, and you'd stand on the street corner watching TV. So that was really the bug of everything that uh, got me into radio. Mm -hmm. uh, and plus St. Louis was the home of Chuck Berry, right? The home of Chuck Berry, the home of a lot of R&B type of people uh, were from in and around that area. Chuck Berry was never played on the KXOKs because that was strictly white music. Mm. And you'd have to go to the WLWs or stations like that in order to hear Chuck Berry and Big Mama Thornton and those types of artists. And it was just a totally different alien type of music mm. that your parents certainly couldn't understand. <laughs> and uh, if you were raised like I was, you know, in the good Catholic school, <laughs> you, 
get your knuckles wrapped for even listening to something like that. It was it was fun. Anyhow, it went from went from there and that point in my life to I got ticked off and decided to leave home when I was 14, and I did and uh, got as far as Tucson, Arizona, and at that point I sort of lied my way into KAIR, and uh, it was one of the first of the rock pop music stations. They had uh, three hour blocks. So if you were the morning band, you worked from six until nine in the morning and from three until six in the afternoon. Mm, okay. And that's the yeah. way that the, everything was programmed. <clears throat> okay. And it was all popular music 24 seven. Well, the owner, popular is in nationally popular or nationally regional? popular music at the time. Oh, okay, that's where you could hear things like Buddy Holly. Okay, I uh, remember that from the time, maybe the Bobettes and Mr. Lee, mm -hmm. or those types of pop singles. So whatever Tammy, was on the Billboard charts, whatever was on the Billboard charts at okay. the time, that's what you played. Okay, and uh, it, it was funky radio at the time. Mm -hmm. The good news is, is we had a general manager, his name was Ralph Anderson, and he knew that I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> he had a slight suspicion <laughs> when there would be great periods of dead air. <laughs> I'm on the floor looking for the record, and uh, oh, it was terrible. So he told me that he was going to do me a big favor, and he was going to fire me. <laughs> However, wait. How old were you again? Oh, was teenager. Okay, maybe fifteen years old, okay. something like that. And did you need a license back then to be on the radio? Uh, you had to have a third class radio telephone license. Uh, in this station, they were covered because the transmitter was someplace else, and they had somebody else who was doing the meter reading. Okay. So the guy who was on the air didn't need one. Okay. So that was cool. And you can get a third class license just basically by applying for one sure. with the FCC. That's how I got into radio. Yeah, well, and if you Stand wanted to go for your first class license, that meant that there were more opportunities because a station that required an engineer on set, if you were a disc jockey and the engineer, you always made a few bucks more. And there was a better choice of radio stations to work for. Mm -hmm. So uh, at some point in my career, I took the time out and went to Ogden's Operational Engineering School in Burbank, California for about six weeks of grotesque training. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about electronics or math Mm -hmm. or any of it that puts together what's the FCC test. He taught you the test, and you went downtown to take the test and sweated bullets like, did I pass or not? I hold the record of being the only person who fell asleep <laughs> during the FCC <laughs> test. And did you pass? <laughs> I did. Oh, okay. I, and I don't know how to this day. Because by the time that you're finishing this class, you're working like 18 hours a day just on getting these formulas right, et cetera, et cetera, which we didn't know at the time. It was but calculus, it was, right? Oh, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. And I can't even spell the calculus, <laughs> you know, much less have anything to do with it. But we had a good uh, time. Uh, that's where I got my first class license. That's sort of what brought me to the coast. Okay. Uh, the West Coast. And we'll get more into the West Coast on the next segment uh, with Johnny Hyde.